Comrades Chairman, Comrades, in preparing these talks on the Minneapolis strikes, I have undertaken to fashion a presentation primarily in a way that I hope will be most helpful to the young comrades who comprise this audience. Recognizing on the one side the importance of class struggle history to the young people of today and on the other side the extremely limited opportunity you have in contemporary times to get a real feel of the revolutionary potential of the working class from the labor movement as it exists today. In fact, each new generation coming into the world faces an experience that is somewhat like the situation when you walk into a theater in the middle of a play. As young people attain maturity, they walk into the middle of a human drama that has been going on for thousands of years. And like the latecomer to the theater, you must first try to orient yourself on the basis of the scene as it is unfolding at the moment. And it takes time to find clues to preceding events and to begin an assessment of what the future holds in store. In fact, it becomes a huge task to grasp the class struggle essence of social history and to begin to arrive at the long view of the human story. From their earliest consciousness of social life about them, young people of each succeeding generation in our society are falsely indoctrinated by the capitalist educational and propaganda media. Capitalist society is presented as the ultimate in social organization. As so perfect an institution that there can be no meaningful change except for the worse. The brutal class rule of monopoly capitalism with its dog-eat-dog -dog social mores is depicted as the ultimate of democracy in what is presented as a so-called classless society. American labor is pictured as a docile reform movement that is wedded to capitalism for all time. Such references as the prevailing capitalist media do make to this country's class struggle history gives the connotation that those struggles involve nothing more than a mob of uneducated workers who were misled by un-American agitators having conspiratorial aims. It is inferred that any legitimate grievances the workers had, that the alleged rabble-rousers tried to seize upon, were handsomely corrected by the fair-minded capitalists once they were called to their attention. That the rabble, as they called it, was justifiably put in its place through police repression that labor agitators were public enemies to be dealt with summarily, as in the hanging of the Haymarket martyrs here in Chicago, 
and that all red-blooded Americans cheered the capitalists and the cops and the hangmen. That's the picture they try to create of the real class struggles that unfold in this country. Confronted with such falsifications of labor history, young people have little to rely on at the outset in their search for the truth. They must perforce begin by trying to assess the revolutionary potential of the working class in terms of the organized labor movement as they see it today. Unfortunately, young people don't get much from the contemporary image of the union movement to help them in that direction. It has been 18 years since the last major demonstration of the power of the working class in the great strike wave of 1945-46. 18 years. That's the whole conscious lifespan of young people today in which there has been no chance to get a feel in life of the revolutionary power inherent in the working class. Instead, you see a union movement that is dominated by a capitalist-minded bureaucracy. A gang of so-called leaders at the head of the working class who support every vicious reactionary foreign policy move of the imperialist ruling class in this country, who back the Washington tyrants in their attempt to strangle the liberating Cuban revolution, who support the outrage against humanity that is being committed in Vietnam today by this same imperialist gang in Washington, who support every action of the imperialists across the world that cuts across the needs and the interests of working people in other countries. A gang of bureaucratic misleaders who are permitting the white supremacists to split the working class by lending themselves, if you please, to generating white prejudice against Negroes in the working class instead of mobilizing labor in solidarity with the Negro people in their freedom struggle to advance the cause of the working class as a whole. A gang of union bureaucrats that paralyze the union power at the point of production Abandoned workers who are losing out in the rat race for jobs under automation turn their backs on the youth coming onto the labor market who can't find a job for love nor money and base themselves on an ever-narrowing strata of privileged or semi-privileged workers who are able to survive. They side with the bosses against the, milit the militants in the unions and in the plants every time the chips are down. And they live like lords on very handsome salaries and they strut about as labor statesmen selling out the interests of the working class day in and day out. They keep labor tied to capitalist political rule destroying thereby the capacity of the unions to really serve the interests of the workers because the power to offset, to checkmate struggles made by the workers at the point of, of production remains in the hands of the capitalist ruling class. They strip the unions of any capacity to influence national affairs and they cause a stagnation of the union movement through adaptation to the capitalist status quo in every way, shape, and form. 
there are a series of adverse consequences to this bureaucratic misleadership that you witness in the unions today. Doubts are created in the minds of young people who have no way to know what the class is really capable of as to whether or not there are any real revolutionary capacities in the working class. Illusions are fed that middle-class intellectuals must step forward and take over the vanguard revolutionary role that is the rightful historic task of the workers. Diverse patterns of opportunists adaptation to capitalist reform concepts become impregnated upon potential revolutionary militants. In other cases, impatient militants try to substitute sectarian adventures for the lack of motion of the mass and get in the way of building the vanguard party, get in the way of forging the struggle movement, get in the way of advancing the basic processes of struggle. Tendencies are steadily fed to proclaim Marxism obsolete, at least in the United States. And in these circumstances, it's not easy for people to perceive objective class truths. And it is precisely here that the revolutionary vanguard party of the working class plays a decisive role as the bridge in historic consciousness to restore an understanding of the revolutionary role of the working class in times such as these, to show how a vanguard party can lead in an upsurge of struggle on the part of the working class. How to apply working class principles in action and how to perceive what is necessary and what is possible by way of advancing the class struggle at a given conjuncture. In the talks that I'm going to give on the Minneapolis strikes, I will undertake to discuss these basic factors in concrete terms of those struggles, to examine the actual role of the revolutionary vanguard party in those mass actions, to study the character of the vanguard party as the highest organized form of class consciousness through which class leadership must be forged. Turning back then to earlier times, let us observe first that the 1934 events which will constitute the central struggle that we are going to discuss, was a study in polar opposites of union policy. On the one side, then as now, there was a bureaucratic usurpation of workers' democracy in the union movement, such as it was. Bureaucrats who distrusted and feared the workers that sought to regiment the rank and file on a dictatorial basis and tried to subvert the union power to their own bureaucratic special interests and in the last analysis to the alien class interests of the bosses themselves. On the other side, appeared a class struggle policy geared to the objective reality of the time. Based on the concept of the workers' right to act in their own class interests, 
which is the fundamental thing that distinguishes workers' democracy from so-called capitalist democracy. Before we take up that struggle, however, I think it will be useful to take a brief look at the objective situation that preceded the explosion of labor radicalization in the 30s. For a good many years prior to the development of those struggles, there had been a relative passivity and a seeming apathy among the workers, just as is the case today. If anything, the situation was even worse because the working class was atomized organizationally. They had no real organizational cohesion to any significant degree, even at the union level. In 1933, the American Federation of Labor, we're talking now about a period before the CIO even came into being, had only some two million members. That was the lowest figure of the membership of the Central Organization of Labor, the AFL, since 1916, 17 years before. And it represented a decline to about half of the some four million workers that were in the AFL at the zenith of the strike wave that followed immediately after World War I. The AFL of that day was headed by an ingrown, reactionary, craft union-minded bureaucracy. They were class collaborationists to the extreme in their relations with the bosses, and they were dictatorial to the nth degree in their relations with the rank and file of the unions. They looked upon the unorganized masses as rabble. And in one of his editorials of the time in the Teamsters magazine, Daniel J. Tobin, the then president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, whom we're going to meet tonight and in the next three days in a whole series of ways under a whole combination of circumstances, that, that then president of the Teamsters Union referred to the unorganized workers, and it didn't, didn't, didn't mean only those that he wouldn't let come into the Teamsters Union in Minneapolis. He met the workers throughout basic industry. He called them rattle. That was his mentality, and it was typical of the mentality of the heads of the craft unions. And in these circumstances, the pundits of those times, as you hear said today, claim that the working class was impotent. It was incapable of asserting itself in meaningful struggle. But then came a revolt of these seemingly docile workers began in several quarters. Minneapolis was one, San Francisco was another, Toledo was a third, started a process of struggle that had its culmination in the sweep and drive of the CIO a few years later. The workers were goaded to action by the problem of deep unemployment under depression conditions, the bosses were slashing pay right and left, and with a, with a uh, boss's market par excellence, from the point of view of the employment relationship, there was total tyranny on the job. And these circumstances impelled the class toward action. A second factor that helped to trigger the explosion was the demagogic act of Roosevelt, 
at the inception of the New Deal after he came to office in the spring of 1933 in uh, enacting the, uh, the uh, National Industrial Recovery Act, which recognized the right of the workers to organize, gave a wedge. Now, another thing to note, and I'm still talking about the alleged passivity and apathy of workers, is that when the workers did move in those days, they brought up their grievances from way back. It would appear then that they hadn't been quite as passive in their desires as it would, it would seem. I recall a comparable situation. I was in Montgomery, Alabama at the time of the King trial during the boycott there in 1956. And a woman took the stand testifying to the discrimination against Negroes in the transportation system there, and she was being questioned by the defense attorney. This was the spring of 1956. And the attorney asked her if she had ever had uh, a bad experience on the transportation system. She began her answer by saying, yes, sir, in 1919, she just, she just rolled the clock in the calendar back and she was ready to just pour forth years and years and years of pent up wrath and determination to do something about it. The judge cut her off, but nevertheless, it told the story. In that sense, you see, apathy is a relative thing. The changes that are taking place in the thinking of a class, of a mass, are not always immediately apparent. Now, from yet another point of view, in labor struggles, you have this historic condition, that so long as workers feel that they have a chance to hold their own and maybe hope in time bit by bit, rib by rib and dab by dab to get a reform or two, they will not tend to radicalize. They will not tend to move forward in their mass into struggle. But the minute they begin to lose ground, something gets taken away from them their present and their future becomes more and more precarious, then tinder begins to pile up, leading toward a potential radicalization. And any one of a whole series of particular sparks can light that tinder. And once ignited, under these conditions, the class struggle fires tend to spread quite rapidly. I'll just compare here again the Negro struggle today. Look at the accelerated sweep and momentum with which the Negro struggle has widened and deepened in just the last few years and you get there a preview in contemporary terms of the Negro struggle of the way mass action becomes contagious within any given mass formation and between mass formations once struggle is in the air. Now one of the sparks was the Minneapolis strikes of 1934 that took place parallel with the battle of the longshoremen in San Francisco and the and auto workers in Toledo, Ohio. Now we're going to discuss now the Minneapolis struggle and in doing so try to go into some detail about the forces in motion, the strategy and tactics that were inherent to the struggle, the nature of the class forces counterposed one against the other, and how you take an idea and at the proper time 
set it alive and, and uh, set a mass of fire with it. The Minneapolis development was exceptional in a number of ways, in addition to this particular vanguard role in the national struggles of that day. It's important to recognize that Minneapolis is an economic byway when you think in terms of the industrial complex of the country. And certainly then there wasn't, uh, there wasn't any semblance whatever of any, any uh, basic uh, industry in the area or even any, uh, any important decentralized uh, uh, a component of a, of a basic industry. In short, it was not in the main theater of class war in terms of masses and in terms of the concentration of those sections of the working class, the industrial workers in basic industry who had the greatest uh, potential power. Another unusual factor was the peculiar political background in Minnesota. There, there existed what was known as the Farmer Labor Party, which, uh, uh, in a sense, cohabited with the Democrats in national politics and yet acted on its own in a number of respects, as we shall see in, in state politics. And this had lent a certain favorable political aura to the potential struggle atmosphere in the town. And in another sense, the action there was unusual because in the manner in which it unfolded, it turned out that the strikes played a big national role. First, by giving a demonstration of what can be accomplished when there is a successful fusion of class spontaneity among the workers and class consciousness on the part of the revolutionary vanguard. It set an example of workers' power in action going up against the class enemy and all its instrumentalities of repression on a no-holds-barred basis and help thereby to stimulate and promote later militancy in the CIO. Now, without the presence of the cadres of our party who were there on the ground, the Trotskyists, in Minneapolis at that time, the labor movement would have remained in the rear guard of the radicalization of the 30s. It would not have been in the vanguard. I gave you a thumbnail description of the, neighbor, of the, of the nature of the general craft union leadership, we'll come to it in more detail later with respect to the, uh, to the uh, Teamsters unions there, but let me just give you a bit of a picture of the, of the other side of the coin. The employers were tightly organized in a setup known as the Citizens Alliance. It was a formation dominated by the biggest, most powerful, wealthiest, most influential bosses around town. And it rode herd over every little fly-by-night boss in the community when it come to labor relations. And through the structure and functioning of the Citizens' Alliance, the bosses had succeeded in breaking every major strike in that town since World War I. They had kept Minneapolis an open shop town. And they had kept employment strictly on the basis of open shop conditions. Everything for the boss and damn little for the worker. And it took a class war to beat this all-dominant boss gang. And that's why if there hadn't been a conscious revolutionary leadership in that potential for struggle, Minneapolis would have remained in the rear guard and would not have played the role it did in the vanguard of the labor upsurge of the 30s.
Let's look a little deeper into that now from the point of view of the key role played throughout the struggles that were to come in Minneapolis by the initial party cadres. By that I mean those comrades who were already in the party, already uh, with revolutionary consciousness as distinguished from others that were to come in later during the struggle. They had a rich political and trade union background. The key figures in the initial party cadre in the Minneapolis situation stem back to the days of the IWW, the Debs movement. They had been among the founding members of the Communist Party. They had been supporters of Trotsky in the showdown fight with Stalin that led to the split in the Communist International in 1928. They were educated, they were seasoned, they were experienced politically, and they had had quite a good bit of trade union experience, ranging all the way from participation in the free speech fights of the IWW to playing key roles as rank and file leaders in such actions as the 21 uh, strike of the railway shopmen. They had been red baited out of the AFL during the period of reaction in the latter part of the 20s. But now these were new times. There were better prospects, and they were about to turn their hand to it and see what they could accomplish. The central leaders of the initial cadre in Minneapolis were comrades Ray Dunn and Carl Skoglund. Not the least of the things that should be observed about the role they played was the tremendous capacity that they showed to work as a team, as a leadership team, all the way through that battle. If you were to talk with them, you can talk with Ray, you can't talk with Carl anymore, he passed on some years ago. They would agree, or would have agreed, that perhaps Skogie made just a little larger contribution on the strategic side, Ray made a little larger contribution on the tactical side. That doesn't mean that Ray Dunn didn't know a whole lot about strategy, and it doesn't mean that Carl Skoglund didn't know a whole lot about tactics. But each just had a little extra shade of strength in these directions. But part of the bigness, part of what it takes to make a revolutionary leadership, and a revolutionary leadership has always got to be a team. You can't build a vanguard party, and you can't lead a showdown fight where you're fighting for keeps if you're going to have a, a leadership that's composed of strutting, posturing individual stars who are, who are more concerned about showing what a big wheeler dealer they are than of, than of selflessly giving everything that's in them to the best of their ability to help along the battle as a whole. This was not the least of the examples. And if teamwork developed in the whole initial revolutionary cadre and, and, and absorbed and integrated on a team basis young revolutionists that were to come right out of the, out of the ranks of the strikers into the party during that struggle, it was before everything else because of this magnificent example that was set by these two central leaders of the local cadre and working as a team. Now in thinking out the broad strategy and the main lines of tactics of the situation, they were thinking in terms of organizing Minneapolis as a start to radiating outward to organize the workers in the whole area. In short, they wanted to get the class struggle battle on the road as best they could as a the beginning there and go forward and do everything they could to carry it. 
as far and as wide and as deep as possible. But they saw the truck drivers as the key to the Minneapolis labor movement because of the peculiar strategic features of the truck driving industry, particularly in a community of that kind. I don't, I don't think I have to go into detail. You see enough trucks around to know that there's very little that goes on in the, in the economic structure that uh, trucks aren't involved to one extent or another, and therefore a strong truck driver's union plays a key role in many respects in, in organizing, building, extending, and knitting the, the power of the working class. But what kind of a truck driver's union did they have to begin with? The International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Chauffeurs, Stablemen, and Helpers was the name of the union. Horses in the greater part of the trucking there were becoming about as rare as a one-armed cornetist with the itch. Stablemen were even somewhat passe. But yet, this was the name. And it was not just simply a matter of a name that was appropriate at a far earlier time hanging on because nobody had gotten around to changing it. The name also typified the mentality <laughs> of the officialdom of the local unions as well as the whole top hierarchy, including Tobin himself. It was a completely craft setup, but even more, it was a it was a polyglot of craft subdivisions of crafts. It wasn't bad enough just to narrow the organizational st uh, structure down to truck drivers, but they had a separate local union set up for for drivers that picked up the garbage. Another one for drivers that haul freight, another one for drivers that deliver newspapers, another one for drivers that went out with a little cart, they used to call him the jewel tea man, went out and sold coffee, tea, spices, bread, and the farmer's almanac in the, in the neighborhoods. What, whatever the particular commodity was, it was the back end of the truck, their tendency was to set up a specific craft local. Uh, for that uh, that sphere, and the result was that it kept the workers broken up into little groups, so that there could never be, even in those small unions, any any uh, collection of workers within a given local who can make any serious trouble for the business agent and the rest of the bureaucrats that dominated the union. Then, to cap the climax, they knit these together in what's called the Teamsters Joint Council in which the officials that sat on top of each of these subdivisions of crafts that I've described to you came together as a council and they had constitutional powers and authorities that contravened to all practical intents and purposes the autonomous rights of these little locals of the subdivisions of the craft. They were class collaborations to the core. Their idea of how to organize was to go out and get a boss here and a boss there that could see the logic of signing a contract with the union if the union would then carry on a propaganda campaign that the organized labor movement of the town as a whole should patronize that boss because he's union. And then they ignored every other unorganized worker. And all they wanted was just enough workers so that they could pay the hall rent at the Central Labor Union headquarters where they, where they uh, acted, and the union business agent who had the key post could get his weekly salary, which he strove with considerable success to make quite handsome. Not the kind of figures they pay today, different times, different uh, criteria, but relative to what the workers were getting, the business agent was paid quite handsomely. And as I have described to you, a bureaucrat-ridden structure. That wasn't a very promising thing, but it was an instrument with which to begin. 
if you look deeper at it. There was a possibility, as events were to demonstrate, that this class collaborationist organizational structure could be used to start a class battle that was going to transform that town and transform the Union in the process of the battle. The main problem was to find a point of entry. Now here we come to a feature of bureaucracies operated then, operates now. A bureaucracy tries to be monolithic, but it does not necessarily follow that a bureaucracy can become or can remain wholly monolithic. It depends on the ebb and flow of the objective processes that militate toward or against struggle potential in the ranks of the working class. In broad terms, you can say that a bureaucracy is divisible into upper and lower echelons. The farther a bureaucrat is away from the rank and file worker at the point of production, the more class collaborationist, the more reactionary, the more dictatorial he will be. But the closer the bureaucrat is to daily contact with the workers at the point of production, the more he is subject to pressures that make him, him, it difficult for him to be quite such a collaborator with the boss, quite such a dictator over the workers. And the upper echelon will dominate the lower, or the lower will shake up a little the upper echelon, depending on whether or not class struggle pressures are being generated um, uh, in, in the ranks of the organization at a given conjuncture. And when struggle moods are developing, when potential for class battle is in the air, one of the important things to do is to begin to look for a place to rupture the bureaucratic monolith. Find a place to drive in a wedge. And that was the problem that confronted the party cadre in, in Minneapolis on the eve of the 1934 battles. The key was found within the executive board of Local 574. Local 574 had what was known as a general driver's charter, which meant it was a catch-all. If some particular body of workers for one reason or another wanted to join the union, the bureaucrats wanted to take them in, they would take them into 574, they might let them remain there a while, or they might put them in another union, or they might create another little craft out of it. It was a kind of a catch basin for workers that accidentally wandered into the union in one way or another, and the bureaucrat liked the color, the color of their money and let them pay dues. The executive board of Local 574 was made up of men who, who worked uh, for transfer companies, as they were called, all freight. Or one was an outfit that, uh, that moved furniture. Uh, another was uh, was uh, representative of a group of workers that were were the, del the delivery men for one newspaper that uh, that uh, the drivers were organizing. So on. the two leading figures were Bill Brown, who was the president of the union, a man that had come out of the industry. He was working full time, not on the organization staff of Local 574, but on the general organizing staff of the Central Labor Union, the composite body of all the AFL unions in the town. The second was a fellow by the name of Cliff Hall, who was a 
milk wagon driver. There was a milk wagon driver's union, but he was on loan to 574 as a business agent because he'd been pretty well trained in the mores of of, uh, of business agenting in, in uh, Teamsters terms of those times, and, and he was a good watchdog to have in the local. Hall was everything that is wrong about what a union leader ought to be. He was the opposite of everything that it takes for, uh, for uh, a leader to serve the interests of workers. It's no accident that he, he got the nickname Beezlebub <laughs> from the truck driver that told quite a bit about what he was. Brown was a man who had a capacity for militancy within him. He had a certain degree of limited social understanding. He had guts which is a commodity without which no leader in any mass organization is worth a continental them. And he had a capacity to be flexible. He got caught in the vortex of the events just at a time when he could have gone one way or the other. He could have gone the road of the gravy train, or he could, as he proved, go the road he went. It, dependent, it depended on what happened in the larger frame of things at that particular moment in his life. But as it turned out, struggle was in the air, the, the potential for the organization of the drivers was present. Brown was this kind of a person, and the Trotskyists were pounding on the door of the Teamsters with of, the, of Local 574 with quite a significant body of men they wanted to bring into the Union. Now, there was one other figure, was the counterpart of Brown, a man by the name of Frozig, who worked on a truck in the transfer industry, who was the one man among those that had been given some kind of a little, uh, a little uh, 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 two-bit pie card by the business agent, a uh, little privilege here, a little privilege there, uh, uh, so they sit on the executive board, and then they would vote with the, uh, with the business agent. Frozig was the exception to this. He quickly proved capable of following Brown as against Hall. The executive board is seven plus the business agent, and it became very quickly a polarization of Brown backed by Frozig on one side and Hall backed by the five other members of the executive board on the other. All right, here's the crack in the door. Now the problem is to get a crowbar, get it properly inserted, and bust the hasp, or knock the door off the hinges, or some way or other get the thing open. The workers in the coal yards provided the coal of the crowbar with which the door of Local 574 was pried open. Now to begin with, a number of the party comrades of the cadre that existed on the eve of the struggle events had gotten jobs in the coal yards, among them Ray Dunn and Carl Skoglin. In these coal yards, they found some young, new potential leaders at hand that were very susceptible to the education that the commerce began to give them about what this whole fight is about and what's got to be done in order to get around Beezlebub, get into that union, get Brown to help us, get Prozic to help us, and let's get this battle going. In addition to that, the workers in the coal yards were chafing under harsh and, working and worsening conditions. I don't know if you ever spent a day operating the business end of a number 10 scoop or lugging coal in 100-pound batches in a canvas sack on a steel frame and sometimes climbing three or four flights of stairs and dumping in somebody's coal box up there. But these are some of the things that these coal yard workers did. And they got long hours, and they got no work unless there was work at hand, unless there was a load of coal to be loaded, a carload of coal to be unloaded in the yard, a load to be thrown on a truck, 
or a batch to be carried in one of these canvas sacks upstairs. And the rest of the time, they just hung around all hours in the coal yard. And the boss says, I don't need you. They sat around. Or if he needed them, he would, he would hire them and give them a starvation wage for whatever limited period of time in a given work day it took to do the job he had for them. And uh, that's the way they got prosperity in this best of all capitalist worlds. They were unorganized. And the union bureaucrats didn't want them. Remember, it's still five to two up there on the local 574 executive board. So it became necessary to start the initial organization drive outside the official union movements. Now, I told you, the coal yard workers had to hang around the yard just while away their time in between this little job or that little job the boss gave them. Well, they used to play blackjack, poker. If they had a particularly good day, they might even get out of paradise and roll them out for entertainment. It leaves a lot of room and a lot of time for conversation, <laughs> and there was quite a subject to talk about. Now, the workers, when they weren't, when they weren't employed, had to be in the yard or were employed, the, the boss... Uh, put up a little shack for him with a pot-bellied stove in it. Perhaps the shack that was provided for them, this is winter time, and it gets cold in Minnesota, as cold as it does here in Chicago. Perhaps the best description of the shacks is that the workers called them dog houses. So the dog houses became the instrumentality through which an unofficial organization drive got started. Then the bosses every once in a while uh, uh, <clears throat> have their get-togethers, compare notes, how you get along, gouging the workers, what do you mean stealing my customer, you know how bosses are, you know, all sweetness and light. And so our comrades, in thinking out the strategy of the thing, they thought, well, why don't we try to play a little on the gullibility of the bosses here? So they accomplished the organization of a general get-together of potential union members, not only with the blessing in advance of the boss, but the boss has paid the hall rent and bought the beer. Because the, they just went to ball, look, uh, you have your smokers, uh, don't you think it makes for... Uh, for uh, better relationships if, uh, if the uh, men get together once in a while and compare experiences. And since you're pretty well off, don't you think it'd be a nice gesture if you bought a little beer for the boys and so on? So between the, the, uh, the conversations in the dog houses and things like the smokers, they began to get a formation among these workers that wanted to organize that Local 574 did not want. And they began to press a few modest demands. Not much. This is another one of the, of the artistries of strategy and tactics in any kind of an action, any kind of a struggle. Uh, one should never be overcautious. But at the same time, it's better to shoot for just a little bit less than you could have accomplished and make it or do a little better than it is to overreach yourself, get a little too fast in your timing, get a little bit too ambitious and try to, try to lop off too big a chunk at once and, and, and get a setback. Uh, the important thing always, when, when you're trying to mobilize and lead a body into action, is to develop a momentum that shows steady gain, steady progress, steady growth in the force, steady development of the, of the uh, possibility for expanding the sphere of action, but always making heading. It's not decisive. I say you shouldn't be overcautious, but it's not decisive in the last analysis how fast or how slow you move, provided you've got the motion going in the right direction. And this is what they accomplished. And it served 
to gather together the forces and develop the necessary struggle momentum to crash into Local 574. But just shortly before that was accomplished, there was an interlude that is worth commenting about. In uh, some other places in the country, one of the places being New York, there were a few petty bourgeois impressionists that listened to the reports that came in, were made at party meetings about the work of the commerce in the Minneapolis coal yards, and they got deeply suspicious. You can't trust these trade union opportunists, and the next thing you know, a charge is advanced that the commerce are practicing company union policies in the Minneapolis coal yards. Now, that wasn't just a phenomenon of that moment. It had happened before, it's happened since. One in every so many you run across are that type today. Experience in the class struggle, or for some reason or other, although they're very adept at reading the books about the class struggle and learning what it says so well that they can oftentimes recite it at length. They seem to have untoward difficulty in understanding how you take those words, those concepts, and translate them into life. Uh, a type, I think you've, if you haven't, you'll meet them in, in your time in the movement. A type, you might say, are a little long on lung power, a little short on brain power. Well, anyway, in this kind of a setting with, with a struggle to come that wasn't exactly uh, a pink tea, there was this interlude where the charge is raised of company unions. I think it's worth mentioning from another point of view. It's very, very important where mass actions are taking place not to be too hasty to make too sweeping and too categoric the judgment about what is going on in the day-by-day, hour-by-hour tactics of that struggle because there are many aspects to it. And oftentimes things move very fast. As a matter of fact, that's again something that is different from the situation today. Today sometimes a person can, uh, can make uh, pretensions about, uh, about having a deep-going knowledge of exactly what ought to be done in a struggle situation. And can appear to be quite an authoritative thinker because at the given moment there is no basis to test the differences of opinion in life. So it becomes a matter of arguing, voting, arguing, voting, arguing, voting. But when struggle is in the air, it doesn't take very long. In this case, it was to take only just a few weeks to demonstrate they didn't know what they were talking about. But oftentimes in struggle, you can make a decision at 7 o'clock in the morning and by 7.45 or 8, or 8 o'clock, the answer is in, who was right and who was wrong, and you take it from there. And that's another reason why it's very important, particularly when struggle is in the air, to not pop off too much unless you've got a reasonable notion what you're talking about. Well, anyway, following this interlude, with the momentum that had been developed, the coal yard workers, led by the Trotskyists, aided by the crack provided in the Union through Brown and Trozik, fought their way into Local 574, a campaign that had started back in the, in the uh, uh, spring of the year 1933, came to this point of culmination uh, in a very fortunate way from the point of view of the importance of the calendar in the, in the coal industry. Coal industry, uh, as it existed then, was principally and primarily one of hauling coal to heat people's homes. And there wasn't much business in the summertime. And it was very important that if a battle was going to be joined, it had to be joined while the weather is cold and the boss had a lot of orders and wanted to get his coal delivered. Well, they broke in, and by February 1934, and February is a cold month in Minneapolis, they got into a strike. 
And here was the first new characteristic. Whereas there had been a little piecemeal attempt, a little piecemeal attempt here and there, in this instance, the minute the, minute the strike began, it was against all coal yards in the town. Just one clean sweep of the coal yards was the aim. And the overwhelming majority of the coal yard workers responded to the strike. As a matter of fact, as many coal yard workers came into 574 the morning the strike started, as had been in the night before when the strike was voted. The workers were, they'd been bitten before, I should tell you. It'll help to give you a feel of it, that time and again, uh, in these setups, they would carry on a fake organization drive. And the idea being to get a few workers to come down and join, pay a $5 initiation fee and a couple of months' dues. And these guys kept two sets of books, one in which they kept their regular members that they let Tobin's auditor come in and look at, and they paid per capita tax on it. Then they had a second set of books in which they took in these initiation fees and dues from the workers, and they conduct this organization drive from time to time, and that they put in their pocket. And they, they never did, and they never intended to do any of these workers. And it was because of some experiences of this kind that, that as many workers came into the union the morning the strike got underway as had come in in order to, to bust through and, 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 and vote the strike in, into process because of the way they had been bitten. Now, the strike was short, and it was sharp. And there were two basic reasons for that. One, it was an extremely militant strike. The coal yard workers went out with the notion that no coal yard is going to be open, no truck is going to haul a load of coal, and not a single basket of coal is going to be carried up, no matter how many flights of stairs on anybody's shoulder, until the bosses settle with the union. A few loads of coal were delivered, but the whole, the whole battle was waged by the militant pickets in such a way that it became crystal clear that the, that the bosses and their minions of the police were going to have to club down a whole lot of coal yard workers before they were going to break the strike and get back to normal delivery. Meantime, the temperature is down between 30 and 35 below zero. And orders are pouring into the coal, uh, coal company offices, and they're getting very nervous. The upshot of it was, between these two factors, that the bosses agreed to settle. They gave what amounted to a qualified recognition of the union and that was tied in with the format of the time, a collective bargaining election conducted by the National Labor Relations Board to determine whether or not the union would represent the workers. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't much of a game from the point of view of the material conditions of workers in the settlement. But it was a strike with limited aims. The aim was to establish the union in this area and get set to take the battle on to a new and higher and broader stage during the summer, and then we would return the following fall when it got cold and we would mop up the loose ends in the coal yards. That was the intention. And it was a only a partial victory, but a very important victory in the sense that it was a victory in what was the first major strike, magnitudes being relative, that had not been defeated since the year of the blue snow in, in the city of Minneapolis. And yet, you should have seen the settlement meeting. The, all the bureaucrats of all the unions around town had been, had been oh, about as nervous as you can get while this battle is going on. Who knows what's going to come of the union movement, you know. This kind of stuff starts.
<laughs> and so the, uh, the uh, question come of voting on the settlement. They had farmer labor aldermen from the city council. They had the secretary of the Minnesota Federation of Labor. They had the organizer of the Central Labor Union. They had a judge that was called a friend of labor. They had a personal representative of Bill Green who happened to be in town. And, and they paraded one after another before, uh, before this body of workers, extolling the virtues of this contract and this magnificent uh, victory. You'd have, thought, you'd, you'd have thought it was virtually the second coming of Christ. The way, the way, the way they uh, painted the thing to the workers, and the strike was settled. Now the bosses had their own ideas, and they weren't unanticipated by the real strike leadership either. The boss's idea was, all right, we got to get this coal moved. It's cold. We can't break this strike quick. But the season will be running out in another month. We'll, uh, we'll chop off the red hots and we'll have this whole thing house broken and back to normal before we get into serious business the, uh, the next fall. And the coal yard workers are no more than going back into the yards and even before the election is held to prove that the workers wanted the union to represent them, which it proved, the bosses begin to take reprisals by firing those who had been the more outstanding uh, organizers and millers, I mean organizers in the voluntary sense of workers on the job helping to organize other workers and those who had played one on another militant role in the strike itself. But this act on the part of the bosses boomeranged, in part because there were a lot of militants in the coal yards that really meant business and in part because it was, it was a life or death question for them. If they didn't go forward and help deepen the momentum of the whole union drive and, uh, and, and expand the whole struggle, they didn't have a prayer of getting back into a coal yard again and where were you going to get a job in those times? The result was that as the bosses began to fire the coal yard militants after the strike settlement, Local 574 began to get an increasing body of volunteer full-time union organizers. And <clears throat> at the same time, something else had happened. When all the yards were organized, already at that level, the tight craft structure of the kind I sought to describe to you had been cracked open in that every, everybody who did anything in any way, shape, or form who wasn't a boss didn't have... The criteria was if you got, the, if you got any authority over hiring and firing, you got no business in union. But anybody who didn't have the authority to hire or fire worked anywhere around the setup, he's in. And they all wanted in. So in a, in a limited sense, but in a very significant sense, we had cracked open already in the coal strike the tight craft structure that had been knit and had laid the basis for the development of the general descriptive concept of how we were going to organize the whole trucking industry and all its environs, and as they say in uh, Paris, it's purlieus too, in, in, the, in the generalized phrase of drivers and inside workers. This became the, the formula around, around which the, uh, the, the, the whole campaign was conducted. Also, the victorious coal strike, as you would anticipate, had set a very important tone of confidence among the workers, opening the way to a general organize, uh, organizing drive. And having seen this transpire, the unorganized workers throughout the whole trucking industry of the city are ready for action because they too are being goaded by the same intolerable conditions that had driven the coal yard workers into action. And they had seen demonstrated before their eyes a proven means to, to uh, advance their wages 
to better their conditions and begin to redress some of the grievances that they'd had in their craws for a long time. And the consequence was that all over town, the workers in and around the trucking industry began to respond in strength to the general organization drive. And the stage was now set for a major class action to be constructed through the formal, to be carried out through the formal structure of what had been a typical class collaborationist craft union and that under revolutionary leadership. Now, at this point, I might observe, as, as will be demonstrated by what is to follow, that in appropriate circumstances, it is not necessary to hold formal office in order to lead. It is possible in appropriate circumstances to move in where there is a leadership default and seek, as was undertaken in using the wedge of Brown and Frosig in 574, to exploit cracks in the official apparatus. And how it comes out is going to be determined not by the form of things as they have existed in a union at a given juncture under, 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 a, under a given set of, uh, of precedent historic circumstances. How it comes out is going to be determined by the dynamics of the class struggle. And in this respect, the cadres that had been forged in the organizing drive in the coal yards blooded for battle in the short, sharp, and sweet coal strike of February 1934 and made full-time volunteer organizers by virtue of the fact the bosses began firing them as soon as they went back into the yards after the strike, that a cadre had been forged among some of the best militants in the trucking industry that were going to become a decisive force in the fights that were to follow. They were to serve as the vital core of the union as we headed into the first of the general strikes of the truck drivers that was to follow in May. And as we went into that strike and on into the second general strike in July and August of the same year, this basic cadre of union militants, I'm not talking now about party militants, I'm talking about union militants, were being reinforced by their counterparts that were coming into the Union and onto the picket lines and into battle from all sections of the trucking industry. In the meantime, another change is taking place. After the coal strike, a volunteer organizing committee was formed. It was made up of a, of a democratically selected body of militants from among the coal yard workers, but the selection was made in a meeting where the business agent wasn't present and his permission wasn't asked, plus Brown and Frosig. Now this voluntary organizing committee, as you will see in our talks, uh, in our discussion tomorrow night, was soon to become the actual leadership of the union. The official executive board of the union was going to be pushed into a minor role and the antagonisms of the bureaucrats in 574, in the Teamsters Joint Council, in the whole AFL movement of the city were to be counteracted through the development of union democracy in the organization drive and strike struggles that were coming. Now, it was through, the, through an initial stage in the introduction of union democracy that one, of the, uh, one major impetus was given to the organization drive. As we go along, I'm going to return in one and another context to this question of workers' democracy as it is manifested in terms of union democracy and these struggles that follow, but I want to note just this one factor at this juncture. 
<coughs> the workers knew what they wanted in material terms. The workers had a rich practical knowledge of the industry and they had an equally thorough knowledge of all the boss tricks. And the device that gave a great impetus to the whole organizing drive on top of the example of the victorious coal battle was the work of the volunteer organizing committee in calling a whole series of meetings of workers coming into the union. They'd be asked to come down. We want to talk to you about joining the union. Or we would go out, we would go out to the garages, to the, uh, to the freight docks, everywhere. And we would talk simultaneously about joining the union and we'd get them together and we'd talk about what ought to be in the demands we give the bosses. And the workers themselves made the decisions and with the, uh, a little generalized guidance from the leadership uh, ar arrived at, uh, at, a, at a reasonable degree of uniformity for minimum demands to be made on wages, hours, and conditions that they were going to fight for. And this is what the union meant to them. All the leadership had to do was just add a few key clauses such as union recognition, guarantees against discrimination, and so on. And with that process well underway, the demands were submitted to the bosses, and the bosses very quickly and very emphatically made it crystal clear that they had no intention of dealing with the union in any way, shape, or form. And now it was up to the leaders, the unofficial but actual leadership of the voluntary organizing committee to steer the workers in a fight for these union demands. And tomorrow night, we'll take up the battle that followed. <clears throat>